So we got Mike Wiesner, Richard Grace, Book Davies, Cameron Gillis. I hope you guys all had a great weekend. What makes data visualization a bit different from other types of animation is that some component of the visual, some aspect of the visual is directly based on some type of science data. So in the case of the tour of asteroid Bennu, the OSIRIS-REx trajectory is actually based on mission data. The model itself, the asteroid model, that is real LIDAR data that was collected from the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. The imagery that you're seeing wrapped to the surface of Bennu, that is actual satellite imagery taken by the spacecraft. And so that's kind of the difference between visualization and animation is we're showing the real data. This is the real asteroid. So if we zoom all the way in on a boulder, that's the real boulder. That's, that's what it looked like from the perspective of the spacecraft. I'm Kel Elkins, and I was the lead data visualizer on the tour of asteroid Bennu. I'm Dan Gallagher. I was the producer and writer on the tour of asteroid Bennu. 
Tour of Asteroid Bennu was inspired by an earlier video that was also made by NASA Scientific Visualization Studio, and that video was called Tour of the Moon. The visualizer, Ernie Wright, used elevation data and high-resolution imagery from a NASA spacecraft called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and he was able to fly the camera very close to the lunar surface and show the actual textures, uh, shadows, highlights, just the way that they would appear if you were hovering close to the surface of the moon. So we kind of borrowed some of those techniques for the tour of asteroid Bennu, really using lighting as a way to help viewers understand the shape of Bennu and the shape of, of, of these different geological features we were zooming in on, which, which just it really helped the visualization come to life. So a good example of how we use LIDAR comes about halfway through the video when we take viewers to a boulder called the gargoyle. Now the gargoyle has a very complex amorphous shape and it looks really different uh, when you see it from different angles in two-dimensional photographs. But when we finally got a good 3D model of the gargoyle, Kel was able to put a virtual camera down near the surface of Bennu and rotate it around the boulder in a way that we never could with two-dimensional imagery. So something really cool about working on this particular visualization, and actually all the visualizations we made for the OSIRIS-REx mission, was as the spacecraft got closer and closer to the asteroid on its way there, and as it spent more time studying the asteroid, the models got better and better. The data that was collected was getting better and better. So some of our early visualization tests, we had this relatively low poly model of the asteroid, and we could only push in so far with the camera. You can't push in too far because then you just see you know, individual polygons. But as we got further and further along, we ended up with five centimeter resolution tiles that you could push all the way into individual boulders. And that's just the nature of how these science missions work. The more time you spend with something, the more data collect, uh, the better the models get. Missions like OSIRIS-REx take us to places that we haven't been before, literally new worlds that we've never experienced but they show us those places in ways that can't always be easily seen. Tour of Asteroid Bennu gives us a way not only to show the public what these places are like, but it almost gives us a remote presence. It allows viewers and even scientists on the mission to see these objects up close through technology. Well, hello everybody. It's uh, Scott and Jerry here for the uh, hundred and what is the hundred and sixty nine ninth um, <laughs> episode of the Open Go To Community. We're glad that you're joining us today. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Um, I was uh, I had some clear skies uh, down the Dallas area and got to. Um, observe uh, Jupiter and Saturn so that oh. was really cool really enjoyed that mm. um, I was you know listening to the video that I just showed um, those guys are getting down to five centimeter resolution I mean that's like that's crazy dang. that would be like walking on the you know uh, the surface with uh, I mean I wonder what your resolution is from just six feet up you know with the human eyes it's got to be uh... It's about one arc minute, so it would be a couple of millimeters, probably. A couple of millimeters. Probably yeah. about 10 times. Five centimeters, so, but, okay. So but maybe just you're glancing up, it. Yeah, just yeah, glancing it. Yeah, maybe you're down. up as high as like 50 feet or something looking yeah, down at it. Maybe 20 you know, feet, so. yeah. Yeah. It's hard to say. Right. right. The shadows and the lighting really helps you pick out details that you normally wouldn't see also. Yeah. It's just really astonishing what the, they're doing in visualizations and you know, with different, you know, taking different data, you know, elevation data and all this other stuff and actual imagery. So mm -hmm. I'm just uh, stunned pretty soon. Is, well, I mean, if it's five centimeters now, what is it going to be in 10 years? It's going to be looking, Crazy. looking at sand or something. So, well, they'll have the, and there'll be telepresence where it'll be just like you're there. You know, you'll have these three, you know, these, augmented reality goggles and everything and you'll right. be picking up rocks and stuff and looking at them and i know and yeah. it'll be a robot it'll be just like you're walking on the uh and we'll have that on the moon too just think about it 
30, 40 years, you're going to oh, be able sure. to walk on the moon, you know? Yeah, you'll go out way. in augmented reality, take in almost real time trips out on yeah. the surface, you know? So yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, maybe, um, you know, there's, uh, um, maybe there's ways that to make you feel like you're in less gravity than you are, you know, I don't know, but, uh, but they're going to, they're going to do things that make it very cool. I also tried a VR experience where you go into a room, uh, uh, you know, and you're wearing a backpack and it's got a HP computer on the back of it. And it's got VR headset, Mm -hmm. you know, it was a first person shooting type of thing. We were, we're shooting robots and oh yeah things, huh. things flying at you and stuff like that but it's just it was pretty pretty impressive what they're doing you know and so i was talking to the it team that runs that and uh uh they were just saying you know they were remembering what it was like 10 years ago you know versus now and we were trying to project what it might be 10 years into the future you know and you'll probably have things just in your home you'll probably take a room and set it up so that it's a VR experience or something. Yeah, right. You know? But it was a bunch of lines and stuff that they had in there. And somehow that cued into the sensors that were on the on the face mask. And, and It'd be uh, like a holodeck, like on Star Trek. <laughs> that would be virtually. fun. You yeah, know? virtually. It'd be the same I mean, way. I want to be like flying through the Orion Nebula and stuff. That would be so cool. Or taking, you know, embarking on, you know, climbing into a spacecraft and uh you know sitting down maybe they have a chair that gives you the rumble or something i have no idea but it's all coming to a virtual reality uh place near you so yeah that's right um oh yeah and book says i did the vr iss tour that was pretty neat they have that on uh i have a facebook oculus i think i've talked about before i've shown it and uh that was the thing that sold me i mean you just you know, you're, you're, it, you look down, you look up, you know, 360 all around you. And, you know, you're seeing the International Space Station. And, and so then, you know, astronauts are giving presentations and stuff to you. And uh, after you're in it for a few minutes, when you take the glasses off momentarily, it's like, boom, okay, now I'm back <laughs> at Earth, you know, so. Right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm a, I am a fan of it. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, sometime in the future, amateur astrophotography um, done, you know, mixed with uh, VR, uh, you know, somehow mixed with augmented reality. I don't know, you know, so, but um, I, I see those as some of the uh, future things that might be done in the amateur astronomy world. So, yeah, but sure. uh, today, today, Jerry's going to walk us through um how to report to the minor planet center this is run by the international astronomical union uh if you know how to correctly make a report you know those are really some of the first solid steps towards being a published scientist and um and these are things that most amateur astronomers can do um you know you already possess uh you probably already possess the the equipment um you need a camera uh if you use gosh even if you just had a dobsonian and a simple camera you could use uh uh nico's uh yeah nico will be on the show tonight on the global star party but uh yeah he's doing astrophotography hand guiding you know yeah right okay now it's it's a little little bit different than that but again it's going to be the standard equipment that most astrophotographers if not all astrophotographers have um there's some uh, there's some qualifications you have to go through, and I'm going to step through that uh, in terms of how you get qualified or certified to be able to report your data. Uh, I think I've talked about before. They they want people that are um, have demonstrated ability to report uh, very um, high quality data. I, I'll put it that way, mm-hmm. in terms of precision measurement and and timing. Okay, so there are some some hoops to go through to to and some skills and knowledge to develop uh, to be able to take the data, the quality data they expect. But once you do that, you can you can uh, 
submit your data and get your location certified to send data. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to walk through that a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to go over. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to I'm going to walk through um, the Minor Planet Center FAQ list. I'm not going to go through all the questions, of course. I'm just going to go through some certain ones to talk about uh, a little bit of the details on how you get certified to send data to the Minor Planet Center. Okay. And I'll give you an example of what uh, what you're rewarded with uh, once you have done that in terms of the, the uh, published reports that they send out. So... <clears throat> I sent this link to Scott on the chat for the Zoom chat. Scott, if you want to send that link out, okay. this is the page sure. I'm on. And this is really the baseline. Uh, there's a lot of information here, but there's also some things in here that you've got to understand that you may not understand when you're reading through this list of questions when you first start. Uh, there's going to be some other information that you need to understand that they'll have links to. My book is also a good source for uh, uh, information about procedures and processes to do this work. Um, but so let's start off, like Scott said, what do I, what equipment do I need? So let me start with that question. And it says almost any type of telescope will do, which of course, uh, you'll need to understand what the focal length of your scope is and, physical, and you need to understand how big your CCD pixels are so that you can calculate the pixel scale. They uh, suggest that you don't use a pixel scale greater than two inch, two arc seconds per pixel or, and at worst three arc seconds per pixel, then it gets the precision starts to be reduced and they, uh, you need to be fairly high precision. This, I think uh, most people shoot for like one arc second per pixel resolution on their imaging uh, when you're doing critical sampling of the sky. Um, and you can determine that yourself, but there's a pretty good range of values with different scopes and different cameras that you have available today. You'll also need a computer uh, to capture the data, the images, mm -hmm. and software to reduce the data. I use a program called Astrometrica to do astrometry. And I've talked about astrometry before on the show. I think I'll probably mention uh, the Minor Planet Center as one of the uh, types of observations you can do and the calculations you can use astrometry with. Um, uh, the next thing is, um, I'm going to skip down. So how do I make measurements? Basically, I'm going to get into this more, but basically the way measurements are taken is you identify the minor planet on your image, which is an X, Y coordinate, and it gets calculated, it gets converted into a right ascension and declination coordinate through a plate solving process. Uh, and uh, that's basically what plate solving is for, is to be able to identify the right ascension declination coordinates of an object that's on your image. Um, the, uh, so let's get started. So. So how you, basically, in order to be able to submit observations, you have to get an observatory code. And, and the question is, how do I get an observatory code? So you have to submit, you have to do, a, uh, learn the process. You have to take observations of sufficient quality and you submit those observations. And we'll go over exactly uh, what types of observations you'll need to take. But you, you, you take your observations and then, and then you report your snail mail address uh, con for contact address. Your observ you, you tell them what the name of your observatory is. You got to tell them where your observatory is located and uh, longitude and latitude in degrees, minutes, and seconds. It's like it's shown here. Um, uh, east of the Greenwich, 
uh, in the WGS, it's very specific to this system, WGS 84 system, which is pretty much what you get when you go to Google Maps or Google Earth. You'll find your location on Google Earth and it'll tell you and, and you can get the coordinates off of that. Uh, you need your altitude in meters. And, and again, again, the source for the specified coordinates such as Google Earth. And then you'll want some details of your telescope. And I'll go over that, an example of that with our, my, um, when I had our, the Mark Slade Remote Observatory certified, I'll show you what that looks like. So this is, the longitude and latitude must be specified to an arc second or better, okay? Google Earth gives you a precision of 0.1 arc second, so that's good. Um, and it tells you about when you need to submit uh, this information uh, to get your code assigned to you. Sometimes it takes a while um, to get your code, depending on what time of the month it is. Uh, they're doing processing during certain times of the month, and so they'll delay sending you your, your observatory code. Uh, so you're, one thing to remember with your observatory code, if you don't, don't realize it already, and I've said it, is that this observatory code is for the location of your observatory. It's not for you. It's not, it's not assigned to you as a person wherever you move. Um, it stays where, you, where, you, where your observatory was when it was uh, obtained or when it was assigned. So, so, Jerry, let me ask you a question about that. Mm -hmm. So when you say observatory, people think that it's like either like a domed observatory or roll-off roof observatory. Could it just be your backyard? So in this context, that's correct. And an observatory is whatever location it is where you have your equipment and you observe the sky. It, it doesn't matter what your equipment is. If you've made the observations and they're, and they're of sufficient quality, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be permanent. It's just the location. So if you do it, in, like my first, <laughs> I've done this twice. I, I, I did the first uh, certification in my front yard, basically at the end of my driveway. So that's where my first observatory code, which is I-24 for, for my driveway. <laughs> so I've got an observatory location at the end of my driveway <laughs> that's certified with the Minor Planet Center. And the other one is, of course, is uh, Mark Slade Remote Observatory in, in Myron's. It's hosted by Myron at his house, and it's in his backyard. So that's where the other location is. Right. So, yeah. So anywhere you, uh, you decide to set up your system, if it's in your front yard or your backyard or wherever, uh, and that's where you regularly observe uh, the sky, then that can be your location. It's whatever... The longitude and latitude and altitude you send them, that's the location that's certified. And the observations must match their calculations for that location. That's why they want it. That's what allows them to determine the quality of your observations so that you know, uh, they know that you're actually taking those observations at that location. Um, there is a, there is a, uh, you don't want to get your certification or if you want to submit observations, you, you can also, there's a, there's a roving observer code that you can use. As, it's like a, a, a temporary code that's assigned for people that want to submit data um, that have different, different locations that they observe from. Uh, but, you, but every time you have to submit data, you have to identify the location every time, basically, to that level of detail. So if you set up, so if you go to a star party somewhere, you have to have a, uh, a GPS to determine your location within uh, an arc second. Uh, or you can, if you got a good, you know, if you got Wi-Fi, you can use Google Earth again to figure out where you're at. Uh, so that's the only, that's the other way you can do it. Uh, but again, you still have to know what your location is and what your altitude is. You can name your observatory anything when you submit it. You can name it whatever you like, except they don't, you know, you have to be somewhat, uh, it's a formal name that gets 
broadcast all over the world. People, when they look up observatories on the list, the official observatory list, your name's going to be on there. So you want it to be um, a good name. That's all I'll say. <laughs> to give an example of not such a good name, such as based on X-Files TV show, Scully as a goddess observatory would not probably pass muster. <laughs> what? Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, they want oh, they to just be, don't like that. They don't, well, maybe they don't have any just, sense of humor, or what's the well, deal? That's probably part of it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so, how do you get started? Um, so what you have to do is you basically, in general, you have to take observations of six six numbered minor planets okay the group you, you basically identify six minor planets that are in different parts of the sky and you have to do uh at least two three four observations of each one three observations on each night and probably at least two to three nights of observations on each one so they want they want not just three or four observations they want like 30 observations of stuff, okay? 20 to 30 observations. So they get a good feel for how repeatable your, your equipment is. Uh, it gets a little more um, a little more tedious when you tear down, you set up and tear down your observatory every night. But that's what I did when I first got my uh, first observatory code. It was my portable observatory. So I set it up several nights. I did I think I did four or five nights of observing over like a two month period to observe the same asteroids. And, um, and I managed to get quality data every time. So that's kind of what they want to see that you have good quality data. It's repeatable and consistent over a, a few weeks of time, not just, you know, like two nights in a row. They want to see that it's good for, you know, at least a month, probably two to three weeks, I would say. Um, so how many, how many observations should you make? Two or three over a period of an hour or so is a good per object, is a good start. Um, and you want to get ones that are numbered not just the brightest ones, but you want to get ones that are, you know, in the first thousand. Uh, each asteroid's given a number, and the first thousand that were discovered, or two thousand, uh, probably a good uh, range of of uh, minor planet numbers to use. Um, let me uh, let me see here. Uh, and then, and then, uh, once you've, once you've done that, you're going to, you're going to report, going to report these codes. Okay. You're going to report these observations. And so how do you, how do you, how do you send them? Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to, um, uh, create this email and I'll I'll show you what it looks like here. See if they've got an example of it. What they did. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I thought they had an example of what the uh, observations look like. Mm -hmm. I don't see my message was bounced. Mm -hmm. I've got I've got an email I think that shows uh, oh, a response. I'm gonna, yeah, let me stop my. Uh, I was looking earlier on my email to find my observations that I submitted. I'm gonna find it. I've got it right here somewhere. Oh, here we go. It. All right, so I'm going to share this. So 
So can you see this? Yeah. So this is what a report looks like. And this was the first report I sent from the Mark Slade Remote Observatory to get certified. Okay. And, and you can see it's got the information I talked about. It's got the my name and address, an email, the name of the observatory, the longitude and latitude, altitude. Got information about the telescope. It's got the observer name for these observations, the person that did the measurement, which was me. Um, here's, here's, uh, here's the telescope. Again, this was the Mead uh, 12 inch that we had in the observatory at the time. F10, yeah. Um, and then here's the observations right here. Got the asteroid number. It's got okay. the, the time date. That's uh, right ascension and declination, basically. Is yep. So it's got uh, it's got the date and time right there. Okay. Which is that first day? Just so that's days, day and partial day. So that's a fraction day time. So that's a five digit fraction, which goes down to the second. And then this is the right ascension and declination that was measured okay. for the object. And then an estimated magnitude. And then there's a filter. That's what V stands for is a filter. And then the X is means that's a submittal for certification. That's what that is. Okay. All right. So um, once you send that in, then you get rewarded. Let me see if I can bring this back up. get rewarded with your observatory code, okay? And this is what it looks like in the official report when it gets assigned right there. Okay. Which is all the information you submit, right? So you, you saw oh. this in the submittal. And it gets registered as a new observatory code. And the observatory code that was assigned to Mark Slater Remote is Whiskey 54. And you can see that also in this report, this report comes out every, every month or so. This was from November 14th, 2016. And these are all the uh, observatory codes that reported observations in this report. And you can see they're all they're all in here. You can see some of them reported a lot. Some of them reported a little bit. Um, so like Whiskey 67, this guy. So the, the way you know this is a new observatory is at the very beginning, um, at the top of the report. Let me take a minute for it to get up here. Let me zoom out a little bit. Let's see here it says new observatory codes. There's there's whiskey fifty four right there. So these are ones that were just assigned during at this report this reporting period. So you get rewarded by having your observations um, uh, listed in the report and under your observatory code. So now it's an official report and it's in their database uh, of observations that they use to calculate the orbits of the asteroids that you observe. That's kind of cool. It's peer reviewed. It's, it's very, uh, you know, it's a very uh, formal process that you go through. But once you've, once you've got certified, then you can submit just like the email I just showed you. So you use, create a report like that and you submit your observations through those emails. And then they show up in the next uh, official report, which is the minor planet. It's called the minor planet circulars. And it's, it's usually in batches at or near the date of the full moon each month. That's an official document, official database. It's uh, available to all, everybody in the, <coughs> in the world.
that's kind of cool. So that's how you do it uh, in a nutshell. And, and you can read, uh, get more details with that link that Scott sent out with the Minor Planet Center and there's other things to learn to do the work. Uh, but uh, that's basically the process. Hmm, cool. So um, is this also a similar process like they uh, for reporting a comet, for example? Yeah, comets are the same way they take okay. position measurement. And this is these are position measurements, and it's it's used to calculate the orbits of these of these objects. Orbits yeah, change yeah. over time, so they have you have to keep up with the objects all the time. Sure. Sure. So is there like a, is it like a form that you're entering in the information to, or what does that look like? There are softwares like Astrometrica provides a uh, form. Let me, uh, let me, let me go over to or do that. Some people just email it into. No, I, so you either correct that. Like I did, like I showed that text email. It's yeah. just that format. You can just email that directly to the Harvard address. It's uh, mpc at harvard uh, dot edu something like that. And the address is in that um, FAQ that, I, that you got the link to. And you just send a text email with your observations, just like I showed earlier, formatted, and, uh, and it goes into the database. It gets read automatically. And you get a, you get a response email telling you they received your, your observations. And uh, you can expect to see them in the next report. Okay. Uh, but there are software like Astrometrica, which is what I use. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be showing that a little bit later tonight during the start party, too. That's going to be part of my talk to show how I use Astrometrica to identify asteroids. And um, that software also has the information uh, that for your observatory. And you can create the emails using Astrometrica and send it in with that. Uh, with that program. And there's other programs also that you can use uh, to create the report to send into the Minor Planet Center. Mm -hmm. It was a question um, where I, I searched the internet for the answer, uh, but it was uh, people wanted to know how to calculate the arc seconds per pixel of your camera. And the formula that I got was multiply the pixel size of your camera in microns Yep. Multiply it by the focal length of the camera or telescope in millimeters, then divide this number by 206.265. Well, the number I come up with, if I have a 1.4 micron uh, pixel camera and a thousand millimeter focal length, so I would take the microns, multiply it by a thousand, and then divide it by 206.265. Um, yep. Does that sound correct? I believe so. I think uh -huh. uh, that's right. Um, so yeah, so, pixel size, pixel size. So I do it a little bit different. So if you go pixel size, okay, let me see, times. So it's like three point eight. Let's say this three point eight microns times right. times two six point two six five. I multiply it, okay, by that, and that gives you a number that's equivalent to what would the um, focal length be for one arc second per pixel plate scale. Okay. So just take 206.265 times your pixel size, and that'll give you the focal length of the telescope that gives you one arc second per pixel. And then I divide that in, then I take my, uh, then I divide that by uh, my, um focal link my actual focal, focal length, length and then okay. that'll give you the that'll give you the okay pixels. so it's the same equation that you had it's just switched around a little bit i use it this way because i like to know what focal length i need to get one arc second per pixel that's the only reason i've got it stuck in my head that way okay so uh so if i so because typically to be critically sampled uh just as a just as a tip for everybody if you want it if you want your uh image plate scale to be critically sampled, which means you get all the information from the sky you can squeeze if you've got two arc second full width at half maximum seeing. So if you're seeing is two arc seconds or two and a half arc seconds seeing, okay. which is typical of a, of a backyard and you want to be critically sampled, then uh, you want to sample at around one arc second per pixel. And so any camera 
If you know what the pixel size of the camera, if you multiply it by that number, 206.265, that'll give you the focal length that you need to be critically sampled on the that sky. That you need, okay. That, that's why that I use it that you... way, yep. Okay. So if, if you, so if you got a camera that's got small, I mean, really small pixels, they're like 2.6 or 2.7 microns, you multiply that by 206.265, you get around 500 or so, 5, 520 or something. So you could be critically sampled with a focal length as short as 500 millimeters on the sky with that camera, which is a pretty wide angle view. If it's a big chip, you know, you can get critically. So what the, so for those that don't understand what critically sampled means, that, that basically means that the sky will not give you any higher resolution than that, okay? which means if you go to a longer focal length, all you're doing is reducing your field of view. You're not increasing anything that you're seeing any better. It's like, it's like when, you, when you amplify a blob, it gets just to be a bigger blob. You right. don't see any more detail. That's all the detail you can see. There ain't no more. So that's another way to think about it. Uh, what critically sampled is, is it, that's, that's, that's all the detail you'll see no matter how, even if you zoom up on it, it's like, and I'm sure people have noticed that with eyepieces, if they have a bad sky, if you're looking at a planet and it's wobbling around a little bit yeah. and you want to see more, you know, you think, well, I'm, I'll put a two times Barlow in there to see, uh, see more yeah. of the, of the planet. Making it and, bigger to make it better. Right, to make that, it bigger and better. It doesn't work. So doesn't that's work. exactly, I... what, that's exactly what this is for image. So that's, uh, that's why I use the oh, So Richard Grace way. is saying, this is why I wonder how people get half arc second guiding with a 200 millimeter guide scope. Well, that's a different, that's a different question now. Okay. So you're using, you're using a, uh, <laughs> it's math. Okay. So mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're basically imaging, uh, uh, and doing a calculation. So let's say a star is a blob. Okay. It's on your image. Okay. It covers, let's say it covers like 15 pixels. Okay. From that 15 pixels of data, you got a different magnitude on each of those pixels or, or a different, um, uh, level, I should say, or, or value on each of those pixels. There's math. It's a centroid calculation math that you can use to calculate. Okay. You know that star is a point source. Where exactly is that point located at within that blob? Okay, you got this blobby yeah. star. You've taken the image. You can use math to calculate. Okay, where is that point source actually at based on the weighting of that? It's like this calculating the center of gravity of that blob. Okay. Okay. That's basically, what it is. It's called the centroid. So now you say, okay, now I know the location of that star within a fraction of a pixel. Okay, because you've done the math. So you've got two dimensions of data. You don't not only have the spatial location, but you also have the amplitude for each pixel. And from that, you can determine that's 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 how you can get a more accurate calculation for the centroid. And that's why you can guide that that with that precision, uh, because you do that measurement that way. It's not detail resolution. It's it's it's, it's statistic. Centroid. The centroid calculation. Right. Got it. So if you look up centroid calculation in Wikipedia or any other, or just Google it, you'll find out all about how that works and why it works. It's pretty cool. When you discover you can measure, and you can measure the location of an asteroid to that, to that precision also, when you're doing your measurements. So someone was saying that, uh, <laughs> let's see, someone was saying, well, I, I guess uh, I got, I have the wrong telescope or whatever. Or the wrong camera. And uh, uh, Jeff Y says, never eliminate a camera book. <laughs> Get more <laughs> telescopes. <laughs> yeah, you could work in sales. You know that? <laughs> so... <laughs> right. Anyhow. You never have enough telescopes. I, I kind of see the opposite happening, though. I see people, I mean, they have a few telescopes that they they're buying more and more cameras, you know, and uh, yeah, I guess yeah. the cameras are getting better, of course, but, uh, um, you know, you look at uh, Gary Palmer, who, by the way, be on the Global Star Party tonight. He hasn't been around. Oh, good. Uh, you know, he's been very busy. So, but he called me 
yesterday when I was in Dallas and said that he would um, he would be making it. So that's great. But I don't know how many cameras the guy has. I mean, he he fits, you know, he's constantly changing up cameras to uh, get better and better performance. So we've got uh, the MSRO over the last five years. We've probably bought six cameras. Wow. Different ones. Um, mm -hmm. Some a couple of them are the same. We've got copies of we got probably two cameras that are the same that we use on different stations, but uh, Myron has bought at least three cameras. I know, and I've bought a couple of cameras. Um, both uh, guide guiding type cameras or planetary cameras, and the uh, and wide field um, big chip, not big chip, but medium sized chip astro cameras, cooled mm -hmm. thermoelectrically cooled cameras. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, cameras are getting better. And the most recent ones we bought are the back illuminated ones, which have quantum efficiencies up near 85 to 90 percent. Oh wow! Okay, which is pretty awesome. Um, that those those chips were around for a while, uh, but they finally started coming down about two to three years ago. They started dropping price, and and now because I think the technology was developed and included in cell phone cameras. They now use back illuminated chips, CMOS chips there okay. to get to get the uh, you know with such tiny <laughs> with such tiny pixels on cell phone cameras, it's amazing. You always wonder how the heck do they get so much? How do they get the noise down so low on those cameras because the pixels are tiny? You know they're yeah. around one one to two microns if if that's big. You know so. You got to realize that, and the way they do it is with the uh, with the back illumination technology, back illuminated. Uh, so it's just so much chips. signal coming up. I see. Yeah. So uh, just just for those that don't understand, a back illuminated chip means that the light passes into the sensor before it gets into the. So there's two layers. There's the processing electronics that go with the CMOS because each CMOS pixel has an amplifier circuit, then it's got the sensing area you know the, the actual pixel so it has to so the the typical cmos chips you pass the light passes through the amplifier into the sensing um area so it's not very efficient you can imagine but the back illuminated chips basically you turn that chip over and so you hit the sensor first and then and then you have the amplifier underneath it so it basically made it so that it would illuminate the actual sensor first, and then and then the amplifier was underneath. So that's what the back illuminated chip does. That's why it's much more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. A little technology. A little technology. First time I heard about um, you know back illuminated chips was on CCD cameras. And I remember they were super expensive. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. Right. Now CMOS has pretty much taken over the astronomical world in the last two or three years. I know even three years ago, people were still saying that CCDs were better, but I think even on a professional side, they've moved over to CMOS now. Mm -hmm. uh, and Santa Barbara Instrument Group and other camera manufacturers are starting to make fairly high dollar professional cameras, big chip mm -hmm. cameras that are CMOS now. Hmm. So which which brand or type of camera did you get for the uh, back illuminated? We've been, I've got a long relationship with uh, the QHY cameras. Yeah, you have uh, a lot of different cameras. Yeah. Bruce Morell, who owns Astro Factors, sold uh, QHY cameras. He was the first distributor in the United States. I've got a pretty long history buying cameras through Bruce. He doesn't sell consumer cameras anymore. He he sells the professional stuff now. So other, uh, I guess he's got some contracts with. Oh yeah. With other people, but right. one of the interesting cameras that we've got that she's that was actually NASA bought a QHY camera was the uh, one that they used to do occultation timing. It's got a built-in GPS receiver for time stamping the images. Oh, that's cool. And uh, it's very, very precise. It's less than one millisecond, uh, you know, precision. 
Yeah. Uh, Great. In terms I, of occultation. I've never done occultation timing stuff, but it seemed like fly fishing or something to me. Oh, yeah. It's... So, you know, you right. really have to have a lot of skill. You have to be in the right spot. Um, right. You know, I think it would be fun, though, to be out with a seasoned team. You know, well, it's like and, anything else when you're doing measurements, especially scientific measurements. You're looking yeah. for little tiny changes in things, you know, and it's yeah. that's the challenge of it. You're, you're looking for it's like looking for a needle in the haystack in some regards. Right. You know, <laughs> you really got to set yourself up to be successful, you know. And uh, timing is everything. And, and actually giving a precise measurement is uh, is always fun. So the Q, the one camera we use that has that is a QHY 174M camera. It's a monochrome camera. It's got the built-in GPS receiver uh, to do this time stamping, uh, precision time stamping on the video signal. And from that, you can determine the occultation time very precisely. And NASA bought it because they had these occultation teams going out to observe, I don't remember what the comet or what the uh, asteroid was, but this is one of the asteroids that uh, they had flown a mission to. I don't know if it was Bennu or oh, one of the other. Yeah, we just these, showed a video about Bennu. Yeah, one of these, I think it might have been Bennu. They were observing from the ground to get more precise timing uh, when it does the occultation so they can calculate the orbit very precisely. So when their spacecraft gets there, they would be able to see it and hit it you know <laughs> so they needed this very precise timing and they use these Q qhy cameras these 174 cameras which is kind of cool so you can actually buy the same equipment that nasa uses on their space uh flight um missions now, was the team that did that were they amateurs or professionals or i think no they were professionals they were they worked for nasa i think uh, -huh. uh but i think they may have invited uh, some amateurs to work with them also. Uh, I know I amateurs remember. do a very good job of doing that. So yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Excellent. Well, okay. So um, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the open go to community. Uh, I know that um, uh, something that uh, you guys are kind of working on, I, I don't know if we're ready to talk about it or not, but uh, you guys converted an LX200, is that right? Oh, yeah, right. Right? I mean, well, that was after we did the other one. So we did. Right. So early on, like. Yeah, you did a ago, Celestron. We did a Celestron a CG or Pro, a CG Pro mount. CG Pro. Teams, and then, then you converted PMCA. an LX200. Uh, yep. Or you're, you're in the middle of it anyway. Yeah, we pretty much got it done. Uh, we're in the middle of testing right now. There's uh, some things with the, uh, I'm, I'm working on the ASCON driver, some adjustments. Mm -hmm. to uh to the thing and uh but it's a belt driven system with the mead lx200 it's a belt driven stepper That's motor cool. with the pmc8 we use the same uh pmc8 electronics that are in the ixos 100 believe it or not oh, okay the, uh, in the uh lx200 is that little a, board it's a 12 That's inch good. it's a 12 inch lx200 so mm -hmm. that little board can power a 12 inch yeah do you remember what the original board looked like it was like oh yeah it was, it was huge. like eight by it was huge right it was like eight <laughs> inches by six inches or something yeah that was the main board that was in the mount you know it's got a big enclosure so you could mount the board in there and then uh and then of course uh the motors had separate boards there's a whole bunch of electronics that we boiled down to this little board now right uh and all the smarts in the there. Firmware. that's true mm -hmm. that's true well very cool so so yeah we're working on that so we got testing. the lx200 I'm, I'm right very curious about that so I'm, uh, <clears throat> very interesting I, can, I don't know if you want to see a picture of it yeah let's see it let me see if i can bring up the picture in out. my email it might take me a minute so you can talk yeah well what i uh, what i will talk about is global star party tonight so let me give you guys kind of the schedule of what's going to happen. Uh, we've got, um, of course, David Levy will be there um, doing introduction and poetry. Carol Orridge, who's the president of the Astronomical League, uh, will be doing our uh, the door prize section. He comes up right after that. Um, Gary Palmer, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, revisits Global Star Party. He hasn't been on for a while, so he's going to be live from the UK. I think shooting live, so he's going to be streaming um, some live images down, which will be very cool. 
Then we've got Donna Smith. I don't know if you know who Donna is, but Donna's been with the sidewalk astronomers for a long time. Uh, I've met her a couple of occasions at events. She did a um, uh, really special event with us called Starlight Festival back in 2015, uh, where we presented uh, John Dobson posthumously, because you know, he'd already passed on, but um, uh, we presented him with a uh, very special award that was given to the family uh, at that event. But Starlight Festival was held in Big Bear, California. We had about 6,000 people visit us, and this was a free event that we did for whole families. And so there was, there were robots there, you know, there was like a full size C3PO or um, R2D2. Um, uh, we had two full size real robots there, which was really cool. Uh, we had um, people who did Hollywood uh, level uh, makeup effects. Uh, and so there were these aliens there. Some of the aliens were like nine feet tall. They were huge. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and then the sidewalk astronomers. Now, this is John Dobson's uh, original group of people that um, really popularized and started, you know, are responsible for starting a revolution in amateur astronomy with a, you know, inexpensive, large aperture Newtonians mounted, you know, on an Altaz swivel base that became known as the Dobsonian mount. So uh, these, you know, Newtonian telescopes on this swivel base are now, and have for a long time been called Dobsonians. I think since the, maybe even the 70s have been called Dobsonians. John Dobson didn't particularly like having a telescope named after him because he didn't really invent it, but he did popularize it. Um, and uh, so um, uh, uh, Donna Smith will be on with us uh, tonight and then next week. Uh, uh, to celebrate the birth of John Dobson. So here's a, and this guy arguably changed the entire face of amateur astronomy with these telescopes. And, uh, you know, he's, his telescopes are known all over the world, but I don't think everybody all over the world really knew who the man was. So mm -hmm. I, it'll be, it'll be interesting to uh, hear from people that traveled with John Dobson, did astronomy with John Dobson, um, you know, and all the stories and everything. So it's going to be very cool. She'll be on uh, at about 7.45 if we're running on schedule uh, uh, tonight with the uh, Global Star Party. Then Jerry Hubble will be, be back with us uh, talking about, uh, you know, live from the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. Cesar Brello, uh, Cesar will be on with us live from Buenos Aires. We'll take a break, and then we come back with Maxi Filarius uh, in Argentina. Nico the Hammer will be on with us. Uh, Cameron Gillis, Pekka Haltala will be on, and then whoever else might uh, join us for the after party. So anyhow, I hope you join us tonight. Uh, it all starts at uh, uh, just before 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. Central, uh, which is midnight uh, universal time. So wherever you're watching from the, around the world, uh, please join us. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, Great. I've got a yeah. picture then. I've got the, um, so let me, I've got a couple pictures to show you. This is the, uh, that's what the cover plate looks like now. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is the board right here. You can see how small it is. So it's right. mounted. Um, you got the lights, the LEDs here, and you got the um, connection uh, for the deck motors right here. Okay. This is, and this is the um, ST4 port, and it's got the USB, mini USB connector to talk to the computer. That's Did what the plate looks like. you have to make a like. special connector for the deck declination axis? No, this is a this is a tip. This this is the same connector that's used in Ethernet. That's an eight pin um, uh, connector. That's the same as what we use now um, on the IXS one hundred. This is the same board. Um, is that what you're asking? Yeah, but the, the, that connector. The, what's the, what's the connector side up to the declination motor itself? This is oh. the same, same as what we're using. It's the DB. It's the uh, 
Yeah, it's a DB9. Like a DB9. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's okay. so let me let me see if I can. If I can so that's been that. modified as well. I see. Yeah, I, I don't guess you can see that here very well. Um, I can't. Let's I have to look motors, for the other pictures. Step yeah, it's motors, motors right. with it's the bell driven down. gear right. set and. Yeah, I've got to find that. those other okay. pictures that shows that. Um, but yes. Um, that's so that's in the works right now. We're testing it. You can see it's got the mead serial number plate sure. there. <laughs> Doesn't look like a mead cover plate, but that's that's because it's a PMC. We didn't put Explore Scientific on here yet, so that's what we have to do also. <laughs> I I've got, got a sticker for you. <laughs> I've got one of those circular badges that goes on the mount, the, 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 oh, yeah. raised, the raised badge. Yeah, I've got the... one of those I can stick on here. Yeah, that's cool. Mm hmm. That's cool. So um, it'll be interesting to see it work, and because I know you guys will be doing astrophotography, so it'll be it'll be really cool to see that work. Awesome. Yep. Um, so when we got the CG mount changed over, we've been using that in Station Three, I think it is installed in mm -hmm. Station Three, and we have the uh, one hundred two on that system. Cool. And it's it's kind of a small roll off roof uh container um observatory like right. a little, little cubicle little cube four foot by four foot cube that's got it in there so, so you know working that, great yeah if you guys want to you know we talk about this uh, almost every time but um uh you know the mark slade remote observatory is a great place to learn how to how to do science you know and you're going to have a group of you know these guys are super experienced but uh they're going to take you you know by the hand and and as a, maybe even as a total rank beginner you could probably go from i don't know how to operate a telescope at all to being a scientist in a few months you know so yeah uh, you can uh yeah we'll cover it everything that you need to know to at least operate our observatory and learn the ins and outs of of consumer level you know semi-professional equipment uh, that mm -hmm. you, that's off the shelf i guess i could say commercial off the shelf equipment that you can buy yeah uh, to build your own observatory and to do these uh to do science with and beautiful pictures too you know and, oh, of course of course mm -hmm. well, once you learn how to do well the see the techniques really are well, all the same. Then... right you know, of course you can make beautiful pictures. You There's know? a hierarchy of techniques, right? So you got the, the the basic techniques that every even professionals learn about how observatories operate and how you do things and how you do the measurements, uh, how you do the processing. It's all descended from uh, the professional world into the amateur world. And, and in some cases, it's gone the opposite direction. It's gone techniques that were developed by amateurs have been floated up into the professional world. Absolutely. Uh, well, especially kind of those techniques in right amateur astronomy, high, you know, so high resolution lunar and planetary imaging was developed on the amateur side before it was done professionally. Uh, although there had been people doing lucky imaging is what it's called, you know, it wasn't really fully developed in terms of um the techniques until amateurs got a hold of it and had to had to use bare bones equipment to get it to work, you know, that really pushes the technology and the software also when you're trying to make an expensive equipment work, do the same things that expensive equipment, you know, you've got $10,000 to buy for a camera. You rely on the manufacturer to, to do it for you, right? Because yeah. you're spending a bunch of money and they're developing equipment that does everything for you. So the professional doesn't have to worry about it. But when you're an amateur and you're spending two hundred dollars on a camera or five hundred dollars on a camera then you have to develop the tools and techniques to make the best use out of it so that's why some of that stuff comes from the amateur side right well very good well we have uh we have a nice lineup of speakers and astronomers uh set up for you tonight um and we will be back in uh just a little over just a little under two hours uh with Global Star Party 61, and uh, we hope that you join us. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off, Jerry? No, I'd just be I'd just be talking more about uh, 
how we do minor planet observing uh, okay. tonight. And I'll probably try to find a minor planet to find and take an image of. Sky looks pretty good tonight. So I'll probably find a minor uh, an asteroid to image and then we'll do a measurement on it and see where it's located at. Great, great. Um, and I also posted the uh, training page for the Mark Slater Remote Observatory at msroscience.org, but you'll see it there. Um, and I think that's it for right now. So you guys have a great one. Uh, uh, make sure you get some uh, uh, dinner and um, maybe some hot coffee, and we'll see you very soon. Good night. Here's the Explore Scientific IXOS 100 equatorial tracker mount. Uh, we've got it mounted up here with a digital SLR that's got the uh, uh, dovetail plate here. We also have it kind of mounted on our extra, extra heavy duty tripod. Uh, but uh, this, this whole thing is operated remotely. You can see Ken's operating it with uh, his uh, Apple tablet here. Uh, but it'll run off a Windows tablet or an Android tablet. What do you like about this whole system, Ken? I find it very intuitive. It's very quiet. Um, like any go-to system, there are things to learn. Sure. But once you learn those things, it makes it really easy to find stuff in the sky. Sure. Now, this is running our Explore Stars app. If you're going to do astrophotography, you need to be running it with a planetarium program, hardwired computer. Ascom, that's right. Ascom so this runs program. wireless, wired, okay? It's super versatile. It not only has go-to uh, capabilities, but uh, you can also add a, um, a guide scope with an auto guider CCD type of camera onto it. So, uh, and you know, the thing that you're gonna really love about this is the price of this instrument, um, which will fit neatly into your uh, budget, I'm sure. So uh, check it out, look online, check out the specs, give us a call if you have any questions. Thank you.